What is coal? Fossil fuel, a black earthy substance which is dug from the ground, and which can be burned for fuel. Of what does coal consist? Chemically, it consists of carbon, volatile matter, sulfur, and ash, with a small amount of water. What is carbon? Carbon is one of the most common of the elements. A diamond is pure carbon, and a piece of charcoal is carbon united with a small portion of oxygen. What is meant by volatile matter? The volatile matter consists of the gases. These are the hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. The combustion of these gases is seen in the flame when the coal is burning. What is the earliest mention made of coal? The first mention made of coal is contained in the Bible, Proverbs 26, 21. As coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is the contentious man to kindle strife. When, and by whom, was this written? It was written by King Solomon about the year 1016 BC, and is supposed by many authorities to refer to charcoal. Was not Solomon familiar with coal? King Solomon's empire contained Syria, which abounds in coal, fossils, and bituminous pits, and it is reasonable to suppose that the coal which is now found in the rocks about Hermon and Lebanon was not unknown to the Jewish king. What are some of the properties of bitumen? Among the properties of bitumen we have naphtha, petroleum, mineral tar, and asphalt. Coal is also supposed to contain some bitumen. Where is the next mention of coal in the Bible? The next is contained in Isaiah 47 14. There shall not be coal to warm at. When was this written? This was written about 750 BC and probably 100 years before the next biblical mention of coal, which occurs in Lamentations 4, 8. Their visage is blacker than a coal. Have we any mention of coal in ancient times besides those made in the Bible? A description of coal occurs in the writings of Theophrastus. Who was Theophrastus? Theophrastus was a Greek orator and philosopher, and a friend of Aristotle. How did he describe coal? He wrote, Those substances that are called coals and are broken for use are earthy, but they kindle and burn like wooden coals. Where did he say they were to be found? He described them as occurring in Liguria and in Elis, over in the mountains toward Olympias. What is the first actual record of the use of coal in England? The first record is in the form of a receipt, which was given by the Abbey of Petersbury in 852 AD for 12 cartloads of coal. How is coal discovered? The discoveries of coal are usually made by systematic prospecting in the rocks which are known to be of the coal-forming period. Accidental discoveries of coal have been made by persons ignorant of geology, but the principal coal fields of America have been developed by the trained prospector. What is the usual first indication of coal? The first indication of coal when found near the surface is a black smut, or, if search is made in ravines or beds of rivers and streams, the prospector looks for small bits of coal, like small black pebbles continuing his search upstream until such fragments disappear, at which point the coal crop is close at hand. What other means, besides patient searching, has been employed to discover coal? There are a great many recorded instances of the discovery of coal by means of the Virgula Divinatorum, or divining rod, which are more curious than instructive. It was said that coal was thus discovered in France in the latter part of the 12th century. What is fire? According to old writers, fire is one of the four primary conditions of matter, or an elementary substance which has the property of devouring other bodies, the other three elements being air, earth and water. In the ordinary sense, fire is understood to mean matter in a state of combustion. What is combustion? By combustion is meant the phenomenon called burning. In coal it is a union of the elements constituting the fuel with the oxygen of the air. What is the mother of coal? 
In examining a piece of bright coal it sometimes occurs that the fragment contains thin layers of a dull black substance, which the observer almost invariably pronounces slate. More frequently this substance is a mother of coal, is often as highly combustible as charcoal, and its presence generally indicates high-grade coal. How can the mother be distinguished from slate? It can generally be distinguished from slate by scraping with the point of a knife. Slate is hard and gritty. The mother is soft and woody. How much tar can be obtained from a ton of coal? From a ton of coal we get about 110 to 120 pounds of tar. How much watery liquor is thus obtained? From a ton of coal we get about 20 to 25 gallons of watery liquor. How will coal be used in the future? The time is not far distant when we will abandon the clumsy inefficient contrivances for burning coal in our houses and workshops. The annoyance of black coal dust, sooty smoke, and grimy ashes will be replaced by the comfort and convenience of fuel gas of high grade and healthful properties. Central plants will deliver this clean and convenient product for all purposes of warmth and power. The impurities and inorganic matter of coal will first be removed, the noxious vapors scrubbed and purified. Then, hand in hand with its beautiful sister electricity, we will introduce into our homes, gas, the pure spirit of coal. In a 1918 article published in the Ottawa Naturalist called Eskimo Food, How It Tastes to the White Man, the zoologist Rudolf Martin Anderson goes to great lengths to convey that the Inuit diet is not actually as unpalatable as the reader has imagined. For example, given sufficient boiling time to break down the meat, an aged white snowy owl can make a suitable tea or supper dish, Anderson notes, adding... I never knew anyone to complain of any ill flavor. Even the food an Inuit might eat only during a famine, such as a caribou robe, for example, is really not so bad as it sounds when boiled soft and tender. As for caribou back fat, Anderson deems it preferable to bacon. But everyone has their breaking point. In the course of cataloging how little of the caribou was wasted by the Inuit, Anderson confesses that, in my opinion, the conservation efforts are carried a trifle too far when they pick out the large grubs of the warble fly from the skin of the caribou in the spring and eat them like cherries. The grubs are very watery and absolutely tasteless, but for some reason the Eskimo seems to cherish them. The English explorer Samuel Hearn wrote of the Dene he traveled with in northern Canada in the 1700s, They could never persuade me to eat the warbles, of which they were remarkably fond, particularly the children. They are eaten raw and alive out of the skin and said by those who like them to be as fine as gooseberries. Danish explorer Knud Rasmussen recounted that he was teased by the Inuit shaman Igjigarjuk for not wanting to partake of the fat maggoty things when they were served for dessert after a feast. No one will be offended if you don't understand our food, said Igjigarjuk condescendingly. We all have our different customs. The Russian anthropologist Vladimir Bogoras wrote of the Siberian Chukchi herdsmen he studied that they very dexterously pick out these maggots when they are big enough from the reindeer's back and eat them with great relish. We would appear to have pretty solid attestation that one of the best things about a successful caribou hunt was that it meant being able to snack on warble fly larvae. Perhaps this helps explain why one of the earliest known carvings in jet dating back to the Magdalenian culture of the Upper Paleolithic period, around 15,000 years ago, discovered alongside a number of so-called Venus figurines, is a pendant in the shape of a larva of the reindeer warble fly, sometimes known as the bot fly. 
Jet, of course, is the name given to a type of mineral that would otherwise be called lignite when one is interested in its desirability as a gemstone. The name derives from a Greek town near Rhodes called Gagai. Lapis Gagates, it was called, the stone from Gagai. Pliny the Elder, dictating from his bathtub in the early 70s AD, described the stone from Gagai in his natural history. It is said that at Cyprus, the sea expels Gagate onto the shore. It is black, smooth, light, and porous, similar to wood in appearance. It is brittle and emits a disagreeable odor when rubbed. Marks made upon pottery with it cannot be scrubbed away. When burned, its sulfurous fumes repel serpents. A solution in wine cures a toothache. Mixed with wax, it cures scrofula. Magicians make use of it in their auguries. When the outlook is good, it will refuse to burn. Notwithstanding the caprices of divination, though, the stone from Gagai does indeed burn. Mineralogists describe lignite as the lowest form of coal because it has more impurities than higher grades and gives off less heat. But most people in the classical era weren't really interested in it as a fuel in the first place. Burning coal was too stinky, and gathering up more of it than could be foraged on beaches and other outcroppings was really not worth the trouble. What was enduring about jet was that, for a stone, it was light, easily carved, and could be polished to a mirror finish. Jet is abundant in Yorkshire County, England, home of the famous Whitby Jet. When the Romans occupied this part of Britain, they built workshops in and around York fabricating jet pins, jet brooches, jet beads, and jet buttons. In the graves of Roman infants who died young, archaeologists have found small bears carved from jet. Medusas and other gorgons were a popular decoration, appearing on cameos and amulets. A common theme is found in the burial sites of young Roman women. The jet gorgon faces forward, four to six snakes visible under her winged helmet, a vacant stare into the middle distance, sparing the innocent viewer from petrification. Tradition has it that jet carvings became popular in the Roman Empire after a visit to Britain by the Empress Julia Domna in 208 AD. Julia was from a priestly family in Emesa, Syria, that worshipped Ilah al-Jabal, the god of the mountain. Ilah al-Jabal, who the Romans called Elagabalus, was represented only by a conical black stone, giving Yulia her nickname Domna, which is Old Arabic for black. This black conical stone was what is called a betel, a religious object predating the use of statuary or iconography to represent a deity. It was more than a mere likeness. Touching or rubbing the betel was said to make direct contact with a god. The religious historian George Moore described the betel as temple, idol, and altar all in one. Indeed, the name betel comes from the Phoenician word for temple, a cognate of the Hebrew Beth-el, house of God, but in our usage, it's much more literal. The ancient Phoenician writer Sanchuniathan called betels ensouled stones, Some were small enough to put in your pocket when traveling or herding livestock. They were often reputed to be literally heavenly in origin, formed from meteorites. In a story told by the 6th century Neoplatonist Damascius, a healer named Eusebius set out one night from, as coincidence would have it, the city of Emesa in Syria, to visit a temple to Athena. When he saw a fiery orb fall from the sky, accompanied by a guardian lion, When the orb had cooled, Eusebius noticed it displayed letters on its surface in deep red, a telltale sign that it was a betel. He asked the betel what god it belonged to, and the stone answered in a shrill, hissing voice that it belonged to Gnaeus, possibly an avatar of Jupiter. The betel had its own clothing, much like the stone Rhea tricked Kronos into swallowing when he meant to be swallowing his infant son Zeus. In fact, this stone too may have been a betel. Later, Zeus got a hold of this stone somehow and placed it at Delphi to mark the site of his oracle. Damascius speculated that Eusebius' betel was divine, but his master, Isidore, corrected him. Not a god, just an ordinary spirit, the kind that's neither good nor evil.
Another story from the third century, written in the form of a soliloquy by Orpheus, imparting secret mysteries to his son, the biblical Moses, tells of Helenus, prince of ancient Troy, twin brother of Cassandra, who, like his sister, was oracular, and whose powers came directly from an iron stone given to him by his lover, Apollo, a stone which was, quote, rough, hard, black, and heavy, graven everywhere with veins like wrinkles. The stone talked to Helenus in the sublime voice of a child. Helenus ritually bathed the stone, cherished it as a babe in soft clothing, and fondled it in his hands, bearing it about as a mother bears her infant. In reward for this reverent treatment, the stone told Helenus of Troy's imminent doom, which of course no one took seriously. The Roman historian Tacitus describes a journey by the emperor Titus to Paphos on the island of Cyprus, where he visited the temple of Ashtarte, which is to say Aphrodite, which is to say Venus, who was not represented there in human form, but in Tacitus' own words, a circular mass that is broader at the base and which rises like a turning post to a small circumference at the top. Tacitus' first battle. In one of the many meandering plot lines of Thomas Pynchon's 2007 novel, Against the Day, a team of scientists collectively known as the Vorman's Expedition, bankrolled by a Rockefeller-esque arch-capitalist named Scarsdale Vibe, is sent to the Arctic to find, dig up, and bring home what the team believes to be a meteorite, but which turns out, upon the expedition's arrival, to instead be a type of sentient mountain called a Nunatak, that may also be a kind of demon. The party is able to scan the object through the deep snows, revealing that it is covered in inscriptions of some kind. The faithful scientists manage to load it into their cargo hold, then begin the slow journey home. Scarsdale Vibe's son, Fleetwood Vibe, a member of the expedition, records what happens next in his journal. Those who claim to have heard it speak as it made its escape, Fleetwood writes, are now safely away in the upstate security of Mateoan, receiving the most modern care. Nothing voiced, all hisses, a serpent, vengeful, relentless, they raved. Others attested to languages long dead to the world, though of course known to their reporters. The man-shaped light shall not deliver you, it allegedly declared, and flames were always your destiny, my children. By the time the expedition reached New York City, they found that the object, which Pinchon also variously describes as the figure and the visitor, had already consumed the city in fire. They were called to account for their carelessness before the Board of Inquiry. It deceived us into classifying it as a meteor, they protested, to which the Board replied, Your whole expedition got hypnotized by a rock. Is that what you're asking us to believe? There is a black stone set into the Kaaba in the Grand Mosque in Mecca. Tradition records this stone as also having meteoric origin. Some stories credit the black stone as having once had the power of speech, addressing itself at various times to Adam, Abraham, and Muhammad. It is reportedly the same stone Jacob used as a pillow when he dreamt his dream of a ladder to heaven. Some legends describe the stone as having once been white, but corrupted into blackness by the sin of mankind, after completing its journey here from the heavens. When vegetation falls to earth, 
in a tropical wetland forest, say of the science fiction kinds that predominated in North America about 300 million years ago, populated by the scaly Lepidodendron, the bamboo-like calamite, and the fern-like pteridosperm, Instead of decaying, it stays preserved in the swampy forest floor where oxygen can't reach it and where high acidity keeps bacteria in check. Over time, counted in the thousands of years, this undecayed plant matter compacts itself into carbon-rich peat, dense, black, and fibrous. Already in this form, if you dry it out, it will burn. Peat was an important fuel source for early humans, and even today, in modern countries without coal or gas reserves, like Ireland and Estonia, it's still burned to generate electricity. Seamus Haney describes peat in his poem Bogland as kind black butter melting and opening underfoot. Most of the time, peat is the end of the line, but if a peat bog should get covered by a river or lake, and that river or lake should form a bed of sedimentary rock over it, the resulting pressure and dehydration will transform it, given tens of millions of years more, into various grades of coal, ranging from lignite to bituminous coal to anthracite, each grade containing more pure carbon than the last. That coal was a kind of stone that could be set on fire has been known for as long as people have been writing about it, which is at least two millennia, give or take, though it's hard to be precise. The Greek anthrakes means something like a burning coal, but the same word could refer to a gem like garnet, which glows red in the light like a burning coal. Anthrakes could also refer to a boil, which is why bacterial anthrax, which covers the skin with red lesions, has its name. The same associations appear in Latin, carbunculus, carbuncle, little carbon, little coal. But Pliny knew you could burn it. The Romans occupying Britain knew you could burn it. Even Theophrastus, pupil of Aristotle and the author of one of the earliest lapidaries, knew you could burn it. The question was, why would you? The forests were full of fragrant hardwoods, linden and poplar, oak and walnut, beech and alder, that didn't stink of sulfur when you burned them. We get a good sense of how disagreeable coal fumes may have been in pre-industrial times from the fact that many people were apparently content to completely forget over and over that one could, if they wanted to, burn coal for fuel. When Marco Polo came back from his travels with news that the Chinese had a black stone that generated intense heat when burned, the people of Venice, just 300 miles from Rome, where Pliny had written his natural history 1,200 years earlier, assumed he must be making it up. Who had ever heard of such a thing as burning stones? Even in coal-rich Britain, already feeling the pinch of deforestation in the early Middle Ages, coal as a fuel source was a tough sell. In 1257, when Henry III was visiting Nottingham where surface coal was abundant, his wife, Queen Eleanor, famously fled the castle and took up residence in Tutbury, 30 miles to the west, complaining that the smoke from coal fires at Nottingham was, quote, unendurable. Now, Eleanor was no fool. She had been given a hygienic treatise by the famous Italian physician Aldo Brandino of Siena called The Regimen of the Body, which stressed the critical importance of avoiding smoke and fumes. The best medicine of the day, still under the strong influence of Galen, embraced miasma theory, according to which bad-smelling air once inhaled or even taken in through the pores had a corrupting effect on the vital pneuma which was a kind of froth in the body made up of blood and breath. Without a concept of pathogens, corrupted air was the best explanation available for the spread of epidemics and plagues, and coal smoke corrupted the air like nothing else. At this point, no one in England was yet burning coal to heat their homes, but it was becoming popular among brewers, blacksmiths, and in other trades which relied on a hot, steady fire that ordinary wood fuel could not provide. It took another three centuries for England to adopt coal for home use. By the time of Elizabeth's reign, chimneys had replaced open hearths, making it possible for the first time to exhaust smoke and fumes from a building in real time, and in the nick of time, too. 
By this point, there wasn't much wood left in the forest. One of the earliest coal fields to be regularly mined was not in Britain, but in the Erzgebirge region of Saxony, in the town of Zwickau, named for the Slavic blacksmith god Zvarog. Before the Industrial Revolution, the seams of coal in the region were used by local peasants much in the way forests would be used for gathering wood. Small shafts would be dug and villagers were allowed to take what they needed for their homes and farms, usually on rainy days when there was no work to do in the fields. Selling coal was prohibited, though some villagers figured out that they could set up dummy stoves, keep the fire burning as low as possible, and take the coal that was supposed to be fueling them and sell it on the side. Industrial coal production began in Saxony, as in England, as in the U.S., in the mid-19th century. In 1868, 2,000 coal miners from Lugau, about 10 miles to the east of Zwickau, wrote to the First International, detailing their exploitation at the hands of the mine operators and requesting admission as members. Karl Marx, who sat on the General Council, asked Friedrich Engels to prepare a report for him to read to the Council in an early instance of what would later be called a worker's inquiry, one of the first attempts to empirically document and quantify working conditions from the point of view of the workers themselves as subjects rather than objects. After presenting Engels' report to the council, Marx wrote him a letter of thanks and told him of his plans to get the report published. The poor devils of Lugau will have the great satisfaction of being mentioned in the English press, Marx wrote. But the English papers rejected publication. Whatever satisfaction the devils of Lugau might have hoped for would have to wait. The mines of the Zwickau and neighboring coal fields closed for good in the 1970s. But in parts of southern Saxony today, the standard greeting is not good day, but good luck. The German phrase is Glück auf, which is not directly translatable, but is essentially shorthand for, I hope you aren't killed in the mine shaft today. Ludlow was the place where the trade used to stop. And occasionally they come in with the strike breakers. And our man would go there, try to talk to them, and company had men come down on horseback. They rode horseback, 15, 20, 25, up to 50 of them. A regular big group with the rifles. I, <laughs> Which group are you referring to now? Ludlow. Yeah, but who was riding on the horseback with the rifles? Uh, the uh, company guards. Okay. Company guards. And our man first used to go up to the Ludlow station. Actually go there and uh, want to be peaceable, but these guys with these guns always tried to stir up a trouble, say, make a funny remarks. And a uh, saloon used to be there. They go in the saloon, get a few drinks, and then they get the little huffy, you know, to want to start trouble. Till our men began to say, well, hell, if they go there with the guns, we'll go with the guns. So <laughs> first thing you tell it, clash. On September 23, 1913, coal miners in the coal fields of southern Colorado went out on strike. The great majority of them had been living and working in closed work camps, private gated villages on mining company land that were wholly owned by the coal companies, the houses, the general stores, the schools, the bathhouses, the barber shops, the saloons, even the YMCA clubhouse. The second the miners in these camps laid down their picks and shovels, they were as good as evicted from their company-owned homes, so they and their families dragged their mattresses and clothes and pots and pans down the canyon to the prairie below 
where the United Mine Workers of America had leased parcels of land and erected tents to house them, each equipped with timbered floors, a wood cook stove, and a barrel of drinking water. In these tents, some miners would spend as much as the next 15 months, though in the timeline we'll be exploring, life in the tent colonies would come to an abrupt stop much sooner than that. There were between 10 to 12 tent colonies in all. Sources don't agree on the exact number or even their names. They traced a 50-mile stretch between Walsenburg and Trinidad where the canyons of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains spill out onto the plains. At a minimum, there were tent colonies located at or near from north to south, Walsenburg, Rugby, Aguilar, Ludlow, Forbes, Suffield, Cokedale, Sopris, and Starkville. Of all these locations, only Walsenburg and Aguilar were proper towns. The others comprised maybe a railroad depot, perhaps a post office and a saloon. But the placement of colonies in these locations was strategic. Behind the colonies, up the canyon in the foothills, were the mines, now running below capacity for want of men to dig out the coal. In front of the colonies were the depots and railroad spurs that any strike breakers shipped in by the mine operators would have to emerge from. In between were the striking miners. Because it was the largest and because it controlled access to Berwind and Delagua canyons where the productive Berwind, Tabasco, Hastings, and Delagua mines were located, the colony at Ludlow was made the unofficial strike headquarters, complete with a command tent, which doubled as a dance hall and meeting place. The colony just to the south of Ludlow at Forbes was situated similarly at the entrance to the Forbes and Majestic Mines. The Berwind Canyon Mines were operated by CFNI, Colorado Fuel and Iron, the largest coal mining concern in the state and in fact Colorado's largest private employer. The Delagua Canyon Mines were operated by Victor American, Colorado's second largest coal company, so Ludlow was of particular interest to the mine operators right from the start. At stake for the United Mine Workers was the entire state of Colorado. They had won a contract in the northern fields in 1908, but when it expired two years later, the mine operators rejected the UMW's new terms under pressure from the owners of the mines in the southern fields, particularly Colorado Fuel and Iron, whose majority owner was none other than John D. Rockefeller, the most economically powerful man in the country. By the time of his death, Rockefeller would go on to accumulate a fortune that has still not been surpassed in all of modern history. The Southern Coal operators reasoned that it would be more cost-effective in the long run to subsidize the Northern Coal companies during the strike than to risk the hit to their profits if the union was to win a new contract in the North, then turn its attention southward. So they put up large sums, tens of millions in today's money, to keep Northern Coal companies in the black, while they fought a war of attrition against the more modestly financed and much more thinly spread United Mine Workers of America. At the 1911 annual convention, then President Thomas Lewis told the delegates that in Colorado, the miners on strike in the northern fields were, quote, fighting against a conspiracy to exterminate the United Mine Workers. The statement was accurate. But unfortunately for the miners, it turned out that President Lewis was an important member of that conspiracy. The extent of his collaboration with the mine operators while president has not been recorded, but we find a hint of it later in the same address I just cited, his last as president. Apparently going off script in his closing remarks, Lewis described to the assembled delegates the vast knowledge he had acquired while serving as a member, officer, and ultimately president of the union over the previous several years. He then told them, without any apparent provocation, whether I shall succeed myself as president of this organization or not, you can rest assured of one thing, the knowledge, the information, the training, and experience I have acquired will not be sold to the operators at a fixed salary per month, and it will not be sold to them in any other manner, because I am not too old to earn a living mining coal, and I haven't too much pride in my makeup to swing the pick. This was on the second day of the convention. On the eighth day, elections were held, and Lewis was succeeded, not by himself, but by John Philip White, who would serve for the next six years. The defeat was occasion for another little speech, 
in which he reiterated his humble intention to take up work as a rank-and-file miner, telling the delegates, When I come back to our international convention in 1912, there will be no contest against the credential of T.L. Lewis because he will come as a member of this organization direct from the picks. He seems to have really liked ending his speeches with the word picks. Instead, Lewis immediately took work consulting for the coal lobby and started up a pro-mining company paper called the Coal Mining Review. When John Philip White took office in April of that year, he found that Lewis had absconded with the union's official records. Lewis did not, as promised, return to the International Convention in 1912. By then, the strike in the northern fields had completely stalled out. The only way for the Union to gain leverage was to, finally, go on a counteroffensive in the southern field. When President White addressed the next annual convention in January 1912, he told the delegates that, It is my candid opinion that the fight in the northern coal fields has been financed and prosecuted by the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company. There is a growing uneasiness among the miners of the southern coal field, and little or no effort would be required now to organize that field. Already as he delivered this address, a United Mine Workers field office had been opened in Trinidad, Colorado on the first of the year. After a year of planning and training, an organizing campaign was kicked off in May 1913, led by John Lawson, who had been in the field since 1903 and who had helped to win the contract in the North in 1908. The organizing campaign was an impressive success. A decade earlier, a bitter fight in the southern fields ended in a complete rout of the United Mine Workers, largely because the operators had managed to populate their ranks with spies and informants. Their attempts to repeat history in 1913 were foiled by an ingenious strategy that we'll talk more about in an upcoming episode. But while the organizers managed to keep a tight lid on who they were and weren't bringing aboard, they did not go entirely undetected. CF&I had an intelligence unit on the payroll, a spy network run by former cop, railroad agent, and private detective William H. Reno, who was tasked with bringing in those private gangs called in the parlance of the time, industrial engineers, or more familiarly to us, detective agencies. There were Pinkertons in the state and men from the Teal Detective Agency, but the primary agency employed in the southern coal fields was the famed Baldwin Feltz Agency, an outfit known well to mine workers everywhere for their role in helping to violently put down the strike in Paint and Cabin Creek, West Virginia, the year before. By the summer of 1913, Baldwin Feltz gunmen were openly patrolling the streets of Trinidad, enjoying the immunity and impunity of their official, though illegally bestowed, status as sheriff's deputies. On August 16, exactly one month before the strike vote would be held, two of these gunmen, Walter Belk and George Belcher, shot and killed United Mine Workers organizer George Lipiati outside the Toltec Hotel after a long harassment campaign that ultimately goaded him into making the first move. Lipiati was the first to draw and first to fall, with six bullets in him. Belcher was hit in the leg, and Belk was left unscathed. They had no difficulties arguing self-defense. Just two months earlier, Walter Belk had been a witness before a Senate commission in Charleston, West Virginia, where he was questioned for his role in the Battle of Mucklow during the Paynton Cabin Creek strike of 1912. In that conflict, in familiar fashion, thousands of coal mine workers went out on strike moving out of their homes into tent villages in the hillside. Belk was hired by the Paint Creek Coal Operators Association to, officially, guard mine property and to, unofficially, harass, spy upon, and if necessary, wound or kill anyone who caused a problem or just happened to be sitting or standing at the wrong place at the wrong time. By coincidence, the chief counsel for the union who cross-examined Belk during the hearing was also a man named Belcher. Albert Belcher, to be exact. No direct relation to George Belcher, the gunman, as far as I'm able to tell. It's just one of those capricious little patterns woven into the fabric of history by the gremlins who run the universe for their own amusement, or who knows, perhaps for ours. A strike in the southern coal fields had already seemed imminent by August 1913. Lippiati's killing now made it seem inevitable. At the convention of the Colorado State Federation of Labor, the meeting Lippiati was in town to attend when he was killed, the mood was grim. An empty chair decorated in black crepe 
was reserved for his ghost should it care to make a Banquo-like appearance. Union leaders had been holding out for a negotiated settlement, but by now multiple overtures to the mine operators brokered by the governor, the deputy labor commissioner, and even by the federal secretary of labor, William B. Wilson, had all been rebuffed. The operators knew that recognition of the union was an irreducible demand for the United Mine Workers, and it was one they were determined not to grant. Jesse Welburn, the president of CFNI, summed up the mindset of the other operators when he described the union as a, quote, labor monopoly, which, in cahoots with the government and other supposed men in high places, was waging, quote, organized and deliberate war in the interest of nothing less than tyranny and despotism. CFNI chairman Lamont Bowers warned that if captains of industry did not take the threat of unionism seriously, they would find themselves under literal military dictatorship. I'm tempted to think that the hysteria displayed in these sentiments was pretty sincere. But even if Welburn and Bowers were just gilding the lily in an effort to build support and morale among their backers, their dismay at the prospect of being even partially dislodged from their positions of wealth and power was no less existential. The Gilded Age was still in full flower in southern Colorado. It would be no exaggeration to call the officers of CF&I and the other coal companies feudal lords. There was very little of political or economic life in southern Colorado that they did not directly control. The operators might be willing to bend here or there on an individual issue of pay or working conditions as an act of largesse, but only on their terms. Allowing their workers to collectively bargain on the broad terms of their employment was simply unthinkable and they were prepared to pay significant sums of money, if necessary, to put down the strike. Union officers in Kansas City set aside $600,000 for a strike fund and added a levy of $1 to annual membership dues to raise another $400,000. Land for tent colonies was leased. Tents were secured. On September 12, John White announced that a strike vote would be held in Trinidad the following Monday. On that same day, a box of Colt revolvers was sent from a hardware store in Pueblo to a hardware store in Walsenburg. The revolvers had been hand-selected by Adolf Germer, international organizer for the United Mine Workers of America. On, in the middle of September, uh, Mother Jones came down and made a and made a, a speech just before on September 15th. The strike was the 23rd. Uh, she made a speech. Uh, would you want it? Would you want to read her speech uh, or just one paragraph? It's just that much. Would you want to read that? Oh yeah, I'll read it. Okay, you could start. On September 15, 1913, the miners at Trinidad, Mother Jones. The 80-year-old veteran of labor war stood up and said, if you are too cowardly to fight for your rights, there are enough women in this country to come to and beat hell out of, of you. If it is slavery or strikes, I say strikes until the last one of you drop into your graves. Strikes, or you, you don't want to read this where you draw a line across it. No, I, huh? no, it doesn't. We are going to stay here in Southern Colorado until the banner of the industrial freedom uh, floats over every coal mine. We are going to attend, uh, stand together and never surrender. Effigy is written, produced, and read to you by Chris Schoen. New episodes come out every two weeks. Now, if, like me, you generally don't bother to rate and review podcasts, I'm not going to ask you to make an exception on my account. On this podcast, we don't assign homework, and we don't put our trust in algorithms. But if you know someone who you think might enjoy this episode, please do share it with them. Also, if you are able, I urge you to subscribe to the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash effigy pod your support helps ensure i can continue to make content like this on an ongoing basis which at this stage is still kind of an open question 
Your subscription will get you early access to each episode, plus exclusive posts from me, and, if the show becomes successful enough, exclusive bonus material. It doesn't cost much. Tiers start at just $3 a month. Till next time, Bella Ciao!